Good afternoon and welcome to the ELEX webinar, Library of Congress Classification, LCC Intermediate. I'm Eva Sorrell, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Bobby Bothman. Bobby is Metadata and Emerging Technologies Librarian at Minnesota State University, Mankato, and Professor in Library Services. Bobby catalogs books, electronic resources, and investigates new technologies. He holds an MLIS from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and an MS in Geography and English Technical Communication from MSU Mankato. Bobby is also adjunct instructor for the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His presentation today will focus on the selection and construction of LC classification call numbers for literature, maps and atlases, and moving images, including the construction of cutters for literary works and juvenile belles lettres. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed. If you have questions for Bobby, please type them into the question box on your screen and he will answer them as time permits at the end of his presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we are on the air will be answered offline and the answers sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Bobby. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And this is Library of Congress classification and intermediate examination. Uh, so a continuation of what we were doing two weeks ago. And here we go. Here I am um, when I met Swatch a couple of weeks ago from Project Runway, if, uh, if you know that. And uh, Mankato, just so you know, was the big bad city in the Little House on the Prairie television program. So most people recognize it when when I let them know um, where that is. So some conventions for today. Uh, CSM, if you see the CSM abbreviation, that is referring to the class classification and shelf listing manual. So that is the um, instruction manual, the how-to manual of, of how you use Library of Congress classification. LAN is the literary author number. So when we start talking about literature, that's what we will be using is, is constructing or, or using is an LAN, uh, LC for Library of Congress, LCC for Library of Congress classification, uh, LCSH from time to time will come up, Library of Congress subject headings, and uh, there may be the use of SH as a shortened form of subject heading. Some tools to be aware of, the Library of Congress classification itself, all of the schedules and the tables and everything that you need are available for free at the first URL that you see right here, uh, the PDF files. The second uh, line here is for Classification Web. That's a subscription service, and so if you go to classificationweb.net, you will get that information that you would need for uh, the subscription uh, details. The Library of Congress Classification and Shelf Listing Manual, CSM, is also freely available and at the URL that you see here from the Library of Congress. Uh, Vanda Broughton has written a second edition of her Essential Classification book that came out uh, late last year. And it is a really good overview of classification principles generally, uh, also treats Library of Congress classification, Dewey Decimal classification, uh, Universal Decimal classification, and some other aspects of classification. So well worth the read um, if you haven't had that. And then there's also the PCC, Program for Cooperative Cataloging, has a section on this page right here called Cataloging Skills CCT. I do not know what they mean by CCT. Um, 
it's called Fundamentals of Library of Congress Classification. So they've got an LC uh, workshop. There's hundreds of slides in there that go into uh, lots of uh, different types of gory detail if you want. Uh, the it's all freely available. All of their training materials and such from the PCC are often freely available up on their website. So those are some uh, tools, these last two, in case you want more information. So learning outcomes today, uh, we will talk about tables so that you have an understanding of how they are applied. You'll see how we construct literary author numbers for individual authors for American literature. And then by extension, you would be able to use this in any of the other schedules for other nationalities or ethnic literatures. Um, how we construct cutters for literary works, how we construct literary author numbers and cutters for juvenile works, which we call belles lettres, and that'll be in the PZ schedule. Uh, we will also see how we construct call numbers for maps and atlases and look at how we can apply uh, the existing LCC PN schedule for moving images and look at an alternative um, to, to that for moving images. So to start out with, uh, a couple of things that will be helpful for you uh, are the obsolete and reserved class numbers that you will see from time to time throughout the schedules. So when you see a number in parentheses, that means it's obsolete. LC has decided to no longer use that particular number or that particular number range. The reason it's there is that it was correct at the time it was used when it was valid. And so you will find materials on your shelf with those particular class numbers and that's how you know what they are. So if you perhaps want to reclass them into whatever is being used now, you can certainly do that if you've got the time for it, I guess. But uh, if you see a number in parentheses, you should not use it because it's not valid right now. It's obsolete. The other thing that you will see are numbers in angle brackets. And the example we see here is the range PS 8001 through 8599. And that is a range that is available for Canadian literature. Uh, this is not used by the Library of Congress. So anytime you see a number or a range of numbers in angle brackets, Library of Congress does not use them, but they have put them here and, and mark them this way to show that they have been reserved for use by other communities that make use of LCC. And so we mainly, mainly I've seen this in the PS uh, schedule and in the K schedule for law. So that's, that's where I've seen them most often. Another thing that you're going to run into from time to time is this general and general special. And uh, this, always bothered me for, for many years as I was learning about this stuff is, what the heck do they mean by general special? And um, it's just one of those things that they had in there for a catch-all because Library of Congress classification does not allow you to synthesize new numbers. It was a place for you to put something when there was, when it's more specific than just a general treatment of the topic, but there's no actual specific number been, that's been created yet. And so you could just plug it in there. It was almost like a parking spot that you could perhaps come back to later and, and review and see if a number had been created for that topic. Uh, the Library of Congress in most schedules has, as you can see over here on the right, uh, where it's the 91 for general special is in parentheses. Uh, they've made that obsolete in most places, but as we can see in physiology, uh, it is not yet obsolete. So technically you can still use it, but the Library of Congress is saying don't do that. Use the general works number instead. So tables. Uh, tables are a way to make use of 
expanding different parts of a schedule, different parts of a topic, particularly when there's a, a theme that goes on. And often what they do is they allow you to arrange something either by geography, so by country or region or state or province or even by city, so you could arrange things alphabetically by city. Um, by form, so whether it's a periodical or directory, something like that, and then also by special topics. So you'll often see in certain uh, subject categories where there will be this other A to Z or special topics A to Z, and then they will have this list of um, cutters that are arranged alphabetically by the topic name but sometimes these exist actually in tables rather than embedded in the schedule itself. So they are uh, applied using substitution. So what you see in the table is, is the table um, number that you're going to create, but the class number is, is something that you're going to take from the schedule itself. And so it's almost like doing algebra, and we'll see an example of it in a minute. And, and that's how you use the tables. It's all substitution. So here's a simple table. So we've got an LCSH heading here of Minority Judges United States. And as we look through the, and do, let's say, a, a, an LCSH to LCC correlation, it directs us to this range right here, KF8770 to KF8788 for judicial officers, court employees under U.S. court organization and procedures. So this is what we see right here. Um, judges general table KF6 is probably the best fit for this particular topic because it doesn't get any more specific in terms of minority judges. So this is the best that we can get to. So when you see something like this where it says table KF6 and it'll be in parentheses, if you're in class web, it will be a hyperlink so you can click on it and go right to it. Um, when you see that, that's an instruction to go there and and employ that table. So uh, even though it's not saying go here, that's that's an instruction to go there. So we've got our KF8775. That's our class number that we're starting with. And then we're going to go to table KF6. So we go to table KF6, and it's kind of a monster table. Uh, not all, most, many tables are pretty short. Uh, this one goes on for a couple of pages, I believe. As I recall, this is just like the, the first two pages of it. And as you can see, there are some um, cutters in here that are obsolete. There are some that have been reserved. And we've even got a table within a table. So this is not terribly common to find a table within a table, but this is part of the law schedule, and I think that's why there's a little more complexity going on here. But uh, the, the cutter that we want is actually much further down the list in, in here. Um, if we keep going down to general works, general works are split up into congresses, official reports, treatises, compendiums, works on comparative and uniform states and, and such. Uh, so the list goes on, and you can see there's only a few that we can use. But what we get right here is this treatises and, and monographs, uh, A9 to Z8. And the reason that we have the A9 is that these other numbers have already been used. They've been reserved. Uh, so we can't start a cutter with a, with a number any lower than 9, A9. So that's what's going on right here. So when you see something like this, treatises, monographs, and you've just got a cutter range, you're usually cuttering by the author. So that's or the main entry, so that's what you're going to use for that. Um, I went ahead and, and pulled the OED definition of treatise out of here, um, and as we can see, it's it's a basically it's a general work. So 
this is one of those things that we see throughout the schedule is that the language throughout the whole of it from A to Z is that the language that's used will change now and then. So it might be general, it might be tree disease, it might be general works, it might be general works and tree disease. So they will mix some of the, these things up. And I think this is partly due to different editors and different subject specialists working in different parts of the schedule over time. So this is, if you recall from last time, was um, almost 50 years in the making for it to be complete. So there's a lot of time and inconsistencies that we see now and then. So this A9 to Z8 is the best fit for minority judges. We've got our class number. We just apply this table right here, and it can be any cutter for that main entry between A9 and Z8. So that's what we will end up with here as our class number. So typically what you see in a table is this dot X. And there are a few places where it's just simply an X rather than a dot X, but in most places it's a dot X. So this is that algebra type of thing. It's a placeholder. So if we look over here on the right, we're in the QC schedule, and we're looking at bosons. We've got a work about bosons, and uh, this is the range that we have for bosons, QC 793.5, points B62 through point B629. And it's telling us to use table Q2. So we go to Q2 and we see this dot X for general works. So what does that mean? That means that the class number that you have already, QC793.5 points B62, that's your dot x, that's the general works. So let's say that our boson work is talking about the effect of particles, effect of boson particles. So this is the, the topic that we want to bring out in this classification. We've got our dot x right here. This is the, the base number, if you will, the base class number. We know that the dot x3 is what makes that number mean the effect of particles. And so we just take this dot x and replace it. So we end up with dot b623. So this right here is the same as this right here. We've just taken this and plugged it into the dot x and that, that becomes our class number. So this is how, basically how the tables work. It's a replacement type of thing. Dot X is the placeholder, and so you've just got to think back to, uh, to your algebra days. Okay, so let's talk about the Library of Congress classification for literary author numbers. So when you need to class a work of fiction, work of literature, usually what you're going to do is you're going to look up that access point in the name authority file. And the name authority file you can get to freely from authorities.loc.gov. If you are a subscriber to Classification Web, the authority file is accessible from the menu there. And many larger libraries probably have the full authority file as part of their, their catalog as well. So there are many different avenues. And of course, through OCLC WorldCat. So you can get to them from a variety of different ways. When you pull up that author's name in the 053 field right here, and usually it's right above their name, you'll find the literary author number, the LAN. And so that's the class number that represents that particular person. And it's constructed so that it always means that person. So we're very used to, for most topics of 
creating a cutter for the main entry, which typically tends to be the author of that particular work, and that works well for nonfiction, but when we're talking about literature and, and fiction, works of fiction, uh, it's always that author, so we have to arrange differently, and that arrangement that we do differently is usually by the title of the work, but it actually comes from a table, and we'll see that in a minute here. <clears throat> what I want you to see and understand is how the literary author number is constructed and, and how it's made. So we go to LCC and we look into the PS part of the schedule and it will tell us for individual authors use this range and because people are more prolific now than they have been in the past, um, you will find that LC has started closing off certain ranges and then opening up new ones over time. So with 2001, the year 2001, we have a new range for individual authors in the PS schedule for American authors. And that will probably close off a little faster than it has in the past just because we are publishing more than we ever have before in history. The way that it's constructed is that the first letter that you see of the last name is represented by the first part of the class number. So PS3554 is the equivalent of the letter D in the last name Donaldson. And then we take the second letter and that's what we do, create a, we create a cutter. And so this cutter, we use, we start out using the cutter table for that. So we learned about the cutter table last time. But the but as you will see, if you do a shelf list for these things, if you try to create one yourself, the cutter table quickly go gets out of whack. And so we start using bigger and bigger numbers and moving a little further, shifting a little further into those four expansion numbers than you normally otherwise would. And so the O here, this is one of the few times that you would see an O in an LC call number, is for the second letter. And then the 469, what it's really doing is it's not representing the NAL, part of the name so much as it is forcing it to be, to file alphabetically between Donaldson, D-O-N-A-L-S-O-N, -S and Donati. So these are the two names on either side of this particular class number in a shelf list of PS3554.0. That way, all the works that are written by Donaldson will use that class number, and then we'll arrange his works using the the cutter table um, based on the table PZ40. So the cutter table, when we arrange works, we arrange it by the title of the work. So what we see here are the three works in a trilogy. So the first one is called Lord Fowl's Bane, the second one is The Ill Earth War, and the third one is The Power That Preserves. So they're listed here, but you see they're not in um, alphabetical order. So when we actually put these on the shelf, the second volume is going to come before the first, which will then come before the third. The What you see here, though, is that the class number, the LAN, is the same throughout, so that way all of the works from a particular author sit together on the shelf, and then they're arranged alphabetically by the work title. And we always omit the initial articles when we create those cutters. The manifestations for each are arranged by publication date. So um, when a work is republished, then the call number up through the cutter is going to be the same. The difference is going to be the, the date of publication at the end. So here's that table, P, PZ40, that tells us what to do with works, literary works. And 
as you can see, uh, it starts out with collected works. You can arrange by date. You can arrange collected works by date or by editor. Uh, the editor actually is obsolete now, so we would only use by date here. Um, for translations, there's a specific number that we use. So if you have that author's work translated into French, for example, and this is what's kind of weird about it, they're all going to be that LAN plus the cutter A3 and then arranged by date. So when we're talking about translations, the cutter table doesn't actually allow us to arrange translations by title. It only allows us to arrange it by the date because this is your second cutter already because you've got the um, the the O in the in the LAN for Donaldson set up already, so you can't go more than two cutters into a LC call number. Um, selected works, so selections by date, uh, separate works by title. So this is what we're really talking about for most of the time. For these works are separate works by title. Uh, and so these would be the the cutters that are arranged that you would arrange by. So if this particular author uh, created a work whose title was Aardvark, as we saw last time, um, the cutter table would have us do A2-2 to arrange Aardvark alphabetically, but A2 has been reserved for English translation, so we can't use A2. The, the earliest we can use is A61 for a work that begins with the letter A. So you've got to be aware of these, of these ranges in the table when you're dealing with uh, works, particularly works that begin with the letter A. For biography and criticism, we've got some ranges down here. Um, autobiography uh, is going to be Z46. Letters would be Z48. And then any biography or critical evaluation, critical work that talks about the author or one or more of their works, that's going to be in this general works zone right here between Z5 and Z999. And so what you end up having to do is you just kind of create a cutter out of thin air uh, somewhere between Z5 and Z999. And it really depends on how many works you have that are biographies or critical works about that particular author, how many you may expect to get. So it can vary by collection, by library. Um, depending upon what you, what you purchase. So if we take a closer look at this, the, remember that the dot X is our literary author number. So whatever our literary author number is, we're going to plug it into what we're seeing in the table. And so for this general work, if we've got a critical work or an autobiography, let's say, uh, that's Z46, so we'll end up with a call number that looks like this. For a critical work, uh, if we've got, let's say, the, the author of the critical work is Barclay, uh, BA from the cutter table ends up being 33, so you could just add 33 to the, to the Z5 that you see right here, or you could go up to Z6, so you can just, you just kind of play with it and, and put it somewhere. The main thing that you're looking to do is to allow room on either side of that particular cutter for growth. So if you expect there is going to be a, um, a lot of um, critical works written about that particular author or that particular uh, literary work itself, then be sure that you move a little further into the the, past the Z5s so that you allow for more room. So the Library of Congress classification PZ is what we use for juvenile fiction. So I know a lot of libraries actually arrange their juvenile fiction just alphabetically by author. 
Um, not a lot of libraries actually are using the the PZ schedule. It comes as part of the Library of Congress records that have been cataloged, so it's there to be used. Uh, I think there are probably a lot of people that, that aren't familiar with it, so they don't quite know how it works. Um, it's similar to the non-juvenile P classification because each author gets their own literary author number in, in the PZ schedule, but it separates works by language. So um, it doesn't distinguish between English, English from the UK, and American from the United States, which is what we do. PS is for American works, PR is for um, English and English diaspora works. So we've got that separation in the non-juvenile area of LC, but in the juvenile works, English is English, so it, it's just by language. Um, and that's what makes it nice in some ways is that particularly if you have different language communities that you want to serve and you want to have your juvenile collection separated out by specific languages, the PZ schedule actually makes that uh, pretty easy to do. So as you can see, we've got a number for JK Rowling here in English. So all of her works, if we want to class them as juvenile and the PZ would use this PZ7 dot R79835. And then her translations into German would be in PZ33. So you can see the the cutter that represents rolling is different and that's based on the shelf list. So it depends on on what actually exists in the shelf list uh, for that particular name and what's around that name. And Another aspect of this to, to keep in mind is that it's not just PZ7 and all of your English language books go into PZ7. It allows you to separate out uh, stories and rhyme, fables. It allows you to separate out animal stories. So a lot of the different types of books and genres of, of juvenile literature that children ask for or enjoy are already separated out and, and nicely contained. So it does some genre analysis as well within the schedule, which is what makes it pretty neat. The cutter table is actually not used for arrangement of works under a particular author. We just use work letters. So we usually take the first two or three letters of the title. And so with Harry Potter, that would end up being H-A-R. And then you add the, the date of publication. So that's how you get a PZ call number for a juvenile book. However, Harry Potter is the first two words of every book in the series itself. So that makes it a little more difficult to arrange. And you will see some um, funny variations. You might see H-A-P, H-A-R, H-A-R-R. Um, so a variety of um, additions and tweaks to those work letters to make things because you want them to be unique, and that way it, it helps to arrange them. Uh, one thing that you can do, and you usually have to do this after the fact, after you either know that there's going to be uh, a sequential number of books that are all going to be like this, or you've got them in, and then you just go back and reclass them, but uh, HA1, HA2, so you could do something like this to help arrange them, and, and this is a, a fairly common practice with certain types of series so that you can get them in, into some sort of order um, by alpha, either alphabetically or numerically if they are a, a numbered type of sequential series. All right, so let's talk um, about maps and atlases now as we progress through our whirlwind tour of Library of Congress classification. The <clears throat> maps and atlases are, 
are a fun part of LC, and they work a little differently than the whole rest of the LCC classification. That's at the beginning of the G schedule, and we've got atlases have this range between G1000 and G3122. Globes are classed between G3160 and G3171. And then maps, anything that's a, a sheet map or a map series or anything like that, is classed in G3180 through G9880. The, what's different about map call numbers is that we have a date in them, but it's not a date of publication like we're used to seeing in the rest of it. It's a date of situation. So we're talking about the date of, it, it, the map itself could have been published in 2015, but if it's talking about, um, if the map is showing events, if it's an historical map, for example, if it's showing events from 1920, the 1920 is the year that we're going to use in the call number itself. The maps, map call numbers make use of table G1A, and G1A does something similar to what the PZ number was doing, where it's pulling out different genres, the table G1A adds subject content to the classification. So uh, there are specific numbers that let you know that it's a specific type of content on the map, whether it's um, um, biology, ecology, geology, um, it might be for roads and transit, so it, it helps you to classify the, the type of map that it is. And then there's a third, or could be a third cutter, the end cutter, the item number part of the call number is a cutter for the main entry. And so this is what makes the map uh, call numbers and atlas call numbers a little different. So um, another thing to be aware of is that the tables G1548 through G9804, there's tons of tables in this range as you can see, they are not included in the PDF. So this is the only part of LCC that's not included in those free PDFs. Uh, the reason for it, the reason stated for it in the introduction to the G schedule is that there are over a hundred thousand cutters in this range alone. Uh, so that's that's quite a big number. I think the um, what LC is thinking about is that people are printing the PDFs. So I don't know how many people actually do that or they do they just use them on the screen, so that could make a difference. The, those tables are part of classification web, so this is actually the only place that you can see them is in class web. So if you don't have access to class web and you do need to make use of these tables, I suppose the, the best method to do that would be either to look up some similar maps in different catalogs where you know there's a, a, a big map library. Um, I know Milwaukee has a big map library, University of, University of Minnesota has a very big map library. Um, the um, Penn State has a very big map library. So if you think about some of those places that you know of that have big map libraries, you might be able to go there and find a similar map and and puzzle out what that number might be for the from those tables. So now we're going to take a look at how this kind of works. So we've got this map over here of the Florida Everglades from the Everglades Foundation. So the the subject matter of this is the Everglades itself. And as we so this is our completed call number that we see up here. So uh, the G3932 is the, the map number for regions and natural features in Florida. So here's, here's the G maps. We're at Florida, and there's general, there's by subject, there's regions, natural features, etc. A to Z, we use table 
G3932 to figure out which region or national nat nat natural feature we want to use. And then we apply table G1 for the subject. So this is how we end up with um, three different cutters in the map call number. So G3932, when we go to that particular table, G3932, and start scanning down, we see that E89 is the cutter number in that table for Everglades. So um, this map does not claim to show the national park itself um, only or to show the wildlife management area. It's just saying that it's the Everglades. So I'm going to go with the more general number here because it is not being more specific. So E89 is what I get as the cutter up here. And then we go to table G1A, and there's the biogeography section, which is D. So D1 is for general, D2 is plants, geography, botany, vegetation, etc. So you can see that the, um, the bigger the number gets with that letter, the, the more specific or, or um, it goes into different topics of different types of maps, different subject matter. So we take that D1 for general because that's the best that we can we can apply to what this map is showing us, and that's how we get this cutter right here, D1. The map, the date of situation for this map is 2006, and so we get that either from the um, the description that the map is telling us. So there's something in the in the actual cataloging of the map that we will know um, or we can estimate what the actual date of situation actually is. And then finally this dot E9. So this is where we've got a a third cutter and it actually is preceded by a decimal. The E9 is for the main entry of the map maker, so Everglades Foundation. So the typically these are just a letter and one number. Uh, it, it's the only piece that goes into subfield B and all it's meant to, to do is to arrange maps alphabetically by map maker when they're about the same, when they have the same call number otherwise. So if you have 10 maps about the Everglades general biogeography from a 2006 uh, date of situation, then they're all going to have this same class number right here. What will differentiate them will be the, the cutter that's used for the map maker. And so you can expand that number as necessary to make adjustments, but usually we start out with just the one number. And then moving images. So for moving images, um, the Library of Congress doesn't collect feature films and things like that. They collect the books about these things. So uh, moving image class the, the classification parts of the schedule for moving images is really meant for books. It's not meant to arrange actual motion pictures or television broadcasts. Um, so there's the range PN 1992.8 for television broadcasts. Uh, there's the range 19, PN 1999.5 for motion pictures, other special topics. So as you can see here, uh, they're, they're, they're topical cutters for different types of feature films or about different topics like Soviet Union or space and time or Spain or sports or spy films, etc. So this is one way uh, to class uh, a feature film, if you will. Um, another way is in the PN 1997, there is in PN 1997.2, which is a, um, which is for motion pictures published or produced after the year 2000, you can arrange them by title. So this cutter range right here is for the title. And again, what you end up with is, is kind of just a, a, a list of, of those. Um, 
something that you can do differently if you want to. What this does not do is this does not allow you to arrange your feature films by uh, language, for example, um, or by director, if that's an important thing for you. And so this is my colleague did this that I'm going to show you here uh, based on a um, poster presentation that was done at an OLAC conference several years ago. And that is, um, I think, in, in, in South Carolina is where they did this. Um, so that's where the idea originally came from. But instead of using 1995 or 1997, they're treating the film as if it were literature. So going back and creating literary author numbers for the directors based on the, the language of the film that they're doing. So uh, you get an LAN for that director and what this does is it allows you to put American films together in PS and German films in PT and um, French films in PQ and British films in PR, etc. So you can arrange them like that. So, you, so the idea is you just create an LAN, literary author number, for the director. Uh, where things get a little hinky is when you have a, a director who directs and does movies in different languages. So Guillermo del Toro, um, who is, I believe he's from Mexico, um, he did Pan's Labyrinth, which was a Spanish language film. And so, and then he did Hellboy, which was English. Um, if we just use one LAN for him for uh, for a number as a quote Mexican literary author, then Hellboy, which is in English, ends up in the Spanish language area. So you may have to adjust these types of things. Or for franchises like Harry Potter or Star Wars or Star Trek, um, where you have different directors but you want to keep those films together, you may have to do some different arrangements for those. But this is a, just a quick peek at an alternative to um, what LCC has, which is mainly geared for books and not for actual moving images. And so that gives us um, a few minutes here for some questions, I believe. We've got a good 10 minutes. Okay, just as a reminder, if you have questions for Bobby, please type them into the questions box. Um, Bobby, can you go back over real quick? There's a question on constructing a class number when you're instructed to add a number from the tables. Yes, so from, do we know where? Maybe uh, from, like here? Yeah, that's probably good. Okay. Um, so just and just to repeat the, the instructions that we're talking about. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure. Okay. So um, as you're going through the schedule, you arrive so up here we've got QC, we're in the QC schedule for physics. And you've got a book about bosons. So you arrive at this range right here. What you don't see in, in this is that um, I, th I think some of this is, is broken out a little more, but uh, the range is QC 793.5 point B62 through point B629. And that 629 is this 9 down here that we can't use anymore, but that's part of it. Um, we use table Q2 to decide which one of these cutters in this range we're going to use. And so if the, um, so it's, you always start out with the, the base number, whatever the lowest one is, which in this case is QC 793.5.B62. It's a mouthful. Um, that's your dot X. So that's, that's your base number, your base class number. So if you just have a general work about bosons, that's the class number that you're going to use. If the work you have is actually about the effect of boson particles, then 
you apply this three to that base number. So the dot X is QC793.5.B62. Uh, you want to make it specific to the effect of particles. So you substitute this into the dot X, and that's how you arrive at this right here. So this three right here is that three right there that we're getting from this table. And this QC793.5.B62 point point is the dot X, which we see right here. So that's the base number. Okay, thank you. Can you go to your slide with the literary authors? Um, there's a question about how does Donaldson come before Donaldson, the S before the D? That is how <laughs> it is in the LC schedule. I don't know. It could be um, there are instances where people's names have been changed, but yeah, the Donaldson, Melvin, Burke, I know it's out of order. Um, it, it should be the other way, but um, that's where it is. So LC messes up. Um, yes. Okay, and um, someone wants to know if you can say, tell them again how to get to the tables. Is there a link on the LC website that will take you to the PDF schedules? So, tables? Um, for the, okay, so if you're using the freely available um, PDF tables, most of them will be at the end of the text for that particular class schedule. Um, there are very few where the tables are extensive enough that they're a separate document or the schedule is, is long enough that the, the table is a special document. So if you don't see a specific link for, um, uh, for tables for that particular class range, that particular class schedule, then they're at the end of all of those class numbers in the schedule. Um, for class web, it's either, class web is, is different because um, some tables you can get to by, in the menu when you're in the browse classification, there's a, there's a button that's called tables. So you can click on that and enter the actual name of the table and it will take you there and you can see it. Um, a lot of the smaller tables are actually um, dynamically brought in and are inherently part of what you're looking at in the schedule anyway. So if you use class web a lot, you've probably used tables without even realizing it because they have embedded it in there. And then um, otherwise it'll be a it'll often be a hyperlink that will that you click on and it'll take you there. So there are certain few situations where they they tell you for the whole range use this table and you would only see that at the top of that range. Um, so if you're at a specific number you might not see that so it's always good to look at the the higher level view, you know, the, the beginning where you've got the full range just to see if there's a, a table that you might need to apply or consult. Okay, what if you're working with a book by an author who is not in the name authority file and doesn't have a literary author number assigned? Then you can, um, you can construct one. And so you go to, so if it's an American author, you would go to the PS schedule. You have to make a decision about if this is a new author or um, like, so from 2001 to now and, and moving forward, there's a specific range in the PS schedule for uh, people who start um, publishing in that time frame. And so people who published previously 1960 through the year 2000, they are, um, they'll be in this range actually in, in where Donaldson is. And um, so even though 
they may still be publishing now their number that was, it was established in that time period, and that's what we go to for that. Um, you just make use of it. You you go through and like this is this is the the number for a D. Um, if their last name starts with E, it'll be PS three five five five, and then you create a cutter for the second letter and numbers, and you go to the LC catalog, you shelf list it, and see if you can um, arrange it. And on the PCC website, they've got a form that you can fill out and submit um, a, a literary author number for an author that doesn't exist in the authority file, and they will check their magic shelf list somewhere. They've, they've got one that's more than what we can see, and in the online catalog, um, and they get back to you really fast, usually, unless somebody's on, on holiday, um, but usually the the next day, or if not, the day after, and you have a response that says, use what you submitted, or they'll tell you to adjust it by a little bit. So it's pretty simple. Okay, thanks. Um, can you talk about what happened to the 2014 proposal on juvenile literary works cutter number. What was the survey outcome and what is the current status? Do you know anything about that? I don't. I oh. This is the first I've heard of it. <laughs> they um, provided a URL, but... <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I, I don't know anything about that. That would be, um, I'll have to check into that. Uh, okay, we'll send that That would that be an interesting thing. I, I know that um, in... So the 053 is what holds the literary author number in the authority file. Um, the PCC has a ban on adding PZ numbers there with no explanation. And I know I've, I've asked a couple of times for them to explain it or reconsider that because it would make life easier for those of us who do use it. But I haven't heard anything about that either. Okay, and um, someone wants to know, what do you think of treating documentary films as you would a print work of nonfiction? Um, that's actually how you would class them. So if you have a documentary film, it would be classed in its subject. That's what the um, that that's how you would you would do it. So um, the documentary Food Inc., for example, would get classed in the number four for food. Okay. And then, um, do they establish PZ7 numbers for um, authors who just start writing children's books when they already have an established literary number? So it depends on, I think it depends on depends on a couple of things. There's, there is some inconsistency. So like if you look at big name authors like Rowling, um, you're probably only going to find PS or PR numbers, excuse me, in, in the LC records for those, even though they're juvenile works. Uh, but I think part of that has to do with the, the mass appeal of it beyond just juveniles. Um, but the majority of juvenile literature mark records that you get that have been cataloged by the Library of Congress, they have a PZ number in it. Um, the, that's what's so frustrating about the, the lack of that PZ number in, in here in, in the authority file record is that really what you end up having to do is, is look it up in the LC catalog if it doesn't come with one and see if that person has, has written something uh, and has a juvenile number that's been created and, and used. So um, there, there's still work to be done with that. I don't know how widespread the PZ schedule is used, honestly. So uh, LC uses it clearly um, and some research libraries and whatnot do as well. My library does. I know the University of Minnesota does. Um, I don't know beyond that who might use it. So it could be a small audience, and that's why it's 
where it is. Okay, thank you. That's all we have time for. Thank you, Bobby, for your engaging presentation looking deeper at the Library of Congress classification. Thank you to all our attendees. We hope you found today's session useful. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form along with links to today's recording and slides. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELEC CE committee improve its webinars and plan future events. ELEX now offers certificates of attendance to webinar participants. More information on this will be included in the email you receive. Information about all ELEX webinars can be found on the ELEX homepage. Please check out our web courses and upcoming eForms. Suggestions for webinars and other continuing education opportunities are welcome at any time. Please contact any members of the ELEC CE committee or submit a proposal for a webinar using the online form on the ELEX webpage under online learning. I would like to thank A. Ping Chin Gaffey and Joseph Nicholson for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support they and their colleagues on the technical support subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you will participate in other Alex Continuing Education events again in the future.